it's more of a bong instead of a bing. <laughs> uh, you know? Uh, you got highly technical there for a second, and then you ruined it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> playing a neckful banjo on stage for the last five or six years and anyone who has seen Wee Banjo 3 in that time will surely recognize the instrument. And my guest today is none other than the maker himself, Tom Neckful, originally from Minneapolis in Minnesota and now residing in Sisters, Oregon, a town that I have a great fondness for. Uh, I have played there and also spent a week fishing there last summer with my good friends, Kristen and Dan. So I do hope you enjoy this quite technical, fascinating, interesting, quirky, and uh, enjoyable interview with the great Tom Neckville. Hit record, just in case I forget. Okay, great. Hi. So where are you right now? Well, I'm in Sisters, Oregon, and uh, looking out on the snow, and it's a beautiful day. You're going to have snow there for quite a while, right? Well, you know, this climate is pretty mild uh, compared to Minnesota, where I, where I grew up. It's pretty much, uh, it's it's really it it melts off pretty fast here. You know, it gets pretty, and then it melts, and then it comes back again. You know, it's pretty nice. So, I mean, let's let's start at the very beginning. Um, you're a renowned banjo maker, and I think renowned maybe is a a curious experimenter as much as anything else. But I, I really want to know, you know, let's go right back to the start of the story. When did you discover banjo? When did you decide you liked it? Were you a musician first or a builder first? How did that all come about? Oh, yeah. Well, good. It, it's uh, it's fun. I, I really resonate with the banjo, and I always have. I think I was uh, in my mid-teens when I first started getting interested in the banjo. Um, one of the first things a young person does, you know, when, when they're a teenager, 15, 16, is you want to exert your independence, you know? And, uh, my sister was bringing home some folky, uh, you know, folk albums and maybe a, occasional bluegrass or, 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 uh, that kind of, uh, ethnic, you know, excuse me. It was uh, music that I hadn't really heard before, and it I I was fascinated by it, and uh, decided to go out and buy a banjo with my own money. Uh, it was uh, paper route money, as I remember, uh, and I bought a banjo, and it sat it sat in the in my bedroom, you know, for a couple of years. While I every time I picked it up, I got frustrated, and Do one you know day what? I was. Do you know what kind of banjo it was? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was called a Bentley, uh, a Japanese-made banjo. It was pretty uh, pretty basic, uh, aluminum body. You know, uh, I think we've all seen and had those banjos early on. Uh, they, they're endlessly adjustable, but uh, they don't sound too good. Um, and then I ended up getting, eventually, I, I stumbled into being able to play. Uh, it was almost an accident. I was playing, I was trying to play and my fingers got so uh, mixed up that uh, I just kind of flew my fingers at the banjo and accidentally hit a couple notes along with the recording. And it inspired me to continue the process and really get serious, you know, and go through that Earl Scruggs book and learn the licks one by one. And, and uh, and I still feel like I'm a student, just just uh, always always challenged by this instrument, and I love it. It's just awesome. For the we'll say the non banjo players, and also for the Irish banjo players who who might listen to this, yeah. can yeah. you explain what a lick is and how it? Because in yes. Irish music, we just learn a tune, and there are yes. no there are no licks. So I'm curious yeah. what you okay what so. Is. So for a bluegrass player, you're playing music in little chunks called rolls or licks. Yes, that a lick could be a roll or it could be a combination of rolls. 
Uh, it could be a memorized group of notes that you play and plug in to various situations where they fit. And I think that that's a, a characteristic of bluegrass is that you play with with memorized roles that fit in mathematically perfectly into those slots of the measures. And uh, you can mix and match uh, your vocabulary of, of roles and licks to suit the occasion. And um, I think the better musician you are, the more that you just learn the tune. But as we all know, there's the banjo has somewhat of a, of a uh, shortened sustain and the note on the banjo uh, often uh, calls for many notes instead of just one, you know, to, to fill in a slower song or a longer passage, you, you fill it in with a flurry of notes quite often. And that's what the, the function of a, of a lick is. It, it'll, it'll come, it'll be sometimes referred to as a fill in, lick on a whole note for example you, you just don't play duh you go duh, 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 duh. <laughs> so so uh i've got my bag of licks and bag of tricks that that i do and uh i think everyone has a signature sort of in their sound coming from their bag of tricks and their licks so so that's what i that's what i do and uh i try i try to stretch the the boundaries of what i play all the time trying to do more things like you guys um always entertaining and always um surprising the listener i um you know you guys are one of my favorite groups for for sheer listening enjoyment thank you tom i was thinking that uh, uh what other instruments might describe the banjo as a flurry of notes instead of one <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I suppose there are other instruments like that, but but I don't know what they are. Drums, kind of. Um <laughs> yeah, they have fills for sure. Fills. Are are, yeah. are, are 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 licks identifiable? Like if you heard somebody playing and they did a lick and you'd say, Well, there's a JD Crow lick, there's a Earl Scrooge yes. lick. Absolutely. And um I have a bit of a pet peeve about about licks because um, there are cliche licks and those that you hear every time you hear a bluegrass um, recording. And on one hand, those are licks that define the genre of music, and they're traditionally based, and they've come they've come to be known as bluegrass sounds, and. Um, you know, as as you know, I I've always been sort of a rebel when it comes to following the dictates of of a specific formula, and I have a feeling that you know music should be as original as you can make it uh, in order to put your own stamp on the music, and so I try to avoid the licks that I hear everybody else playing, um, although. I do have to echo those licks in in ways that uh, come across as sounding like bluegrass when I'm playing a bluegrass song. So it's it's a it's a fine balance to to be original sounding is uh, is something that I strive for, but at the same time it can alienate you if you're playing in a real traditional setting. Um, I wonder if yeah. that goes for Irish music too. I mean. That was exactly what I was thinking, is that and I was going to ask, are there modernized licks that when you hear them, that they're straying outside of the boundaries of what would be considered strictly traditional? And I mean, that's a mm -hmm. crazy debate. Like, what does that even mean? What's traditional? Do we bookend it on a certain date and say everything before and after this <laughs> chapter yeah. is not yeah. traditional? Yeah, and I, I say no boundaries there. Um, you know, when I hear other instruments besides banjo i guess my my ears gravitate to the banjo but when i hear other instruments playing a wild break it seems to me like that's accepted on most other instruments to play whatever you can get away with i think of tony rice for example as a bluegrass guitarist he played every note in the book um and a lot of times it was uh 
you know, very jazzy sounding and, and uh, adding that element to his music, I think just expanded the realms of bluegrass. It, it made, gave permission to other guitar players to go outside of that uh, sort of predictable box that, that we hear so often. And um, the banjo seems to get, criticized if it goes too far and people would say oh that's not bluegrass anymore if the lick is too um uh, chromatic sounding with half steps between each note and then a, a, a big flurry of notes that uh, may not be related to the song can be distracting and that's where the art of it comes in, I guess, to know when it's appropriate or when it serves the music to do something that is is kind of um, unusual sounding. And uh, that's it's a continual um, skill to develop and to to develop your taste as well as your skill and being able to do these things. Um, yeah, it. It's very interesting because a lot of people people will will play what they can play, and it may not fit with the music. And I maybe am guilty of that occasionally. If I learn a new lick, I'll strive to put it into a song somewhere, even if it there's no real compelling reason to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, surely uh, Bela and. I'm thinking of <laughs> Noam Pekelny, like the 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 music that they play, you know, oh, goes yeah. so far outside of the realms of strictly traditional music. I mean, they must be bringing the role of the banjo and broadening it on the way. Oh yeah, sure, the stage they are. Uh, yeah, and and there's there's just a super uh, technical skill that has been developed. It's so hard to play at the speeds that we try to play at. And to get the notes correct and to avoid just falling apart and <laughs> having mistakes. Um, so the, the, you know, the attempt to do things like they're, they're doing is, well, it's futile for me really, to be quite honest, I can't play at the same level of musicianship that those guys can play, but I can find my own uh, little stamp on the music. I can find my own, um, you know, little sounds that that work that may not be commonly heard in other people's music, and that's that's what I'm looking for in 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 my music. Um, and when it comes to expanding the realm, yes, those guys are doing that. Uh, but I would say that it would be difficult to expect, you know, like human beings, normal humans, to achieve that high level of superhuman. Uh, ability that they, they they can throw out on their instruments. Uh, so I'm continually amazed when I listen to those guys. There's uh, there's quite a lot of that happening in bluegrass music. If you think of the phenomenal mandolin players and you know even the fiddle, I, can, I yes. immediately think of Sierra Hall and Chris Thiele, like technically mm -hmm. mind blowing musicians. Technically, yes. Tech and and yeah, I I um, now do you play with mostly a flat pick or all all a flat pick? Yeah, on, in, on, only ever only, ever. yeah, flat pick only. Okay, yeah. yeah, and that is that is something that my you know is mind blowing because you get so many notes you know from <laughs> from one plectrum. Um, you know, it's it's like I've got three plectrums basically on on three fingers and can't do the speed that that you can do with one flat pick it's uh, it's amazing so how long are you building banjos building banjos i started in the the mid 1980s and my first banjo was a uh, that i built was was a copy of a master tone type banjo and a friend of mine had the a few components that he was working on and he kind of reached a he had done some artwork and inlay on this neck so i adopted the neck from him and finished the job and did all of the 
the technical tone components, you know, and uh, fit the neck to the body and learned all about how a banjo is made. Um, I got a lot of help from Bill Sullivan at a company called First Quality uh, Instrument Supplies. They were in Louisville, Kentucky back then, and uh, Bill was real helpful at, you know, giving me some professional pointers, you know, what you do when you're building a banjo. And he's the guy that uh, really was involved in in building a lot of the banjo parts for Gibson banjos when they kind of were resurrected and and came back with high quality banjos in the in the eighties. And um, so I I had some connection right with the 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 country's best banjo builders, and I was talking to Gibson. I was talking to Deering. I was uh, developing my ideas and trying to kind of show the world what I had. And they were definitely um, they were definitely interested, but we never I never connected with any of the other um, banjo builders. Yeah, so what, that initial moment when you said, right, I'm going to build a banjo. Because mo- mo- most people just play and they're like, I'm, I'm going to try and get better and I'm going to try and play with these people and maybe I'll start a band and whatever. Uh, for, very few people go to build banjos. Yeah, this was part of my growing up experience as I was um, approaching 30 years old. I was looking at the things that really excited me in my life and I was trying to develop an actual career path for myself. And while I liked playing, I didn't uh, have a particular uh, unusual talent at that, and I didn't uh, think it was practical for me to go out and become a a banjo musician solely, but I did want the banjo to be a big part of my life, and in in other parts of my life, I'd always liked design and um, inventing things and and, uh, trying to be creative and artistic, and so I put my love of the banjo with my love of design and became a banjo designer. Um, that Those two words, banjo and design, were the result of like a self-study that I made with a work a workbook. Uh, I think it was called The Adventurers. And it w- it's a way to figure out what you're going to do in your career path. And so I followed the directions in this career book. Um, I can't, I can't imagine the people that wrote the book had any notion that Banjo Maker would be at the end of the yeah, process. No, no. It was an open-ended book. It could be, uh, you know, a, a tire salesman or a uh, <laughs> snow shoveler or something. But but the uh, but the the answer at that end of that book was not. Um, it was not encouraging because <laughs> I, I look at my life as, uh, you know, with the future of building banjos and um, it does not look very lucrative. And so I had one caveat and that was, well, if, and only if I could come up with a banjo idea that was completely original, that would fit within the realm of banjo, but would be totally heads and tails, new design, Above what is available now and better. Well, then I would divert my life towards banjo design and building. And I had not a clue of what I was going to do with the banjo to make it, you know, like really fantastic. But I did realize through the process of building my first banjo that there were a lot of idiosyncrasies and problems with the instrument. And if you could get rid of all of those those damn parts, the hooks and the nuts and the rods and the hoops and and somehow simplify the function of a banjo, it would be fantastic. And maybe I could make a living on a design like that. Well, I didn't know what it was, but a friend of mine named Sam uh, suggested that I screw the head on to a banjo uh, like the cap of a jar. And if you can think of a mayonnaise cap or a peanut butter jar, you know, and it's got the the threads that are all around the outside, could you do that with a banjo head? And so the first thought was, well, you can't really screw on a banjo head, but maybe you could 
maybe you could screw something else that would make the pressure on the head work. So the the thought um, bounced around my head for a day or two, and I came up with the uh, Gila mount design, which is the helical mounting of the tone ring and head into the frame of the banjo and then the the jar type thread is is actually on a, a flange that screws into from the back of the banjo holding all the rest of the components in place so so i i you know i i was fascinated then just from the very onset of the idea thinking this is it now if i can if i can go get a lathe, you know, I knew the kind of machine I needed to make the parts. If I could have a lathe, if I could make a cast uh, aluminum piece big enough to machine, maybe I could make a prototype myself. And so I did that. I uh, went out and went to a auction, machinery auctions, and I found a lathe that was big enough to turn a banjo rim on. Um, the rim is is inside the banjo, and then the frame, I call it, is the metal outside of the banjo. But I was able to to come up with prototypes. My first one was only eight inches diameter, and then I made a twelve. In, I mean, I'm sorry, eleven inch banjo, which is the standard size that we, most of us use. And uh, the first one was was very resophonic and very dark sounding because there was no um, there was no uh, openings in the side of this banjo. It looked kind of like a hubcap with with no um, no voids or any nothing really to let the sound out. And so uh, I I kind of cut away parts of the casting allowing sound to sort of come in and out of the instrument and it began sounding more and more like a banjo and uh in fact it had a deeper more sort of uh, resonant quality that i thought needed to be um you know explored further so i just never stopped i i came up did, with a prototype that looked did, good so did you understand the we'll say the science behind why it sounded deeper and more resonant or was that something that you figured out later on or was yeah, it was it was intuitive at first i think that the intuition that i had uh, about about removing um structural components that are holding tightly onto the tone ring and rim as you release them and let them just freely float in the in the structure of the the banjo there's um, there would be a tendency to to sound less uh, tinny, less bright. Uh, there'd be more um, a, a deeper quality ability for the components to resonate more fully without being impinged or impeded by the many connections of metal parts that are in a normal banjo. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a is that why? So, sorry, Tom. Is that is that the reason that you, you use a ball bearing tone ring? Well, yeah, when it by Am I jumping I so ahead? <laughs> There's so many. That's a good question. The ball bearings are used as a uh, anti-friction device because when you're tightening this banjo, you have um, a turning motion going on inside of the instrument. Without the ball bearings, you need another surface uh, which the the parts would slide upon one another. And, you know, I've used Teflon as a interface, a low friction interface, and that works nicely, but it's a little bit difficult under high pressure of the head. When you get it up to playing tension, it's very difficult to tighten it uh, using the Teflon ring. So I uh, had a, a brainstorm one day and decided to throw a bunch of parts back into the banjo. Uh, I had taken about 80 parts out of the banjo by designing the Gila mount. And when I went to the, uh, the 80 ball bearings, it's like I'm putting parts back in, but their function was really to isolate the tone ring um, to allow it to 
rest upon the ball bearings and resonate uh, without being impinged by a lot of connections to metal parts. But then there, there's those 80 metal parts that the tone ring is sitting on. But if you can imagine like a bell, it's just sort of suspended on these little points of the ball bearings and able to really do its musical job without any interference from other non-musical parts that are just designed to uh, as hardware, basically. So I think we've separated the structural parts from the musical parts and allowed the musical parts to do their job without, you know, without mucking up the the waters with uh, the parts that were just designed to mechanically hold the instrument together. So on on my banjo, there there are some steel ball bearings, I guess, and some white marble ones. Is that just, is that a tonal thing as well? It's, just no, that's look. kind of an aesthetic uh, thing. Um, we have three different kinds of ball bearings that we typically use. Uh, some of them are white uh, plastic, and they're just they're almost like just uh, fillers or space taker uppers uh, that we put between the metal balls. You wouldn't want to use the plastic ones in too much too big of a number because they might sort of absorb some of the vibrations of the instrument and cause a, a less um, brilliant sound. So I like to use uh, the hard ball bearings, which would be the, uh, the steel ones. And then for lighter weight and keeping the, uh, the banjo to a minimum, uh, to a more comfortable weight, you, you can use ceramic ball bearings. And so I frankly don't remember what's in yours, but I think it's steel and maybe some Delrin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a, it's just balancing the weight. And um, if you put in all steel ball bearings, it's a fantastic sound and it maybe adds a few more ounces of weight. But um, generally speaking, our banjos are not uh, overly heavy. Uh, and we have options that make them, you know, extraordinarily light as well, mm -hmm. depending on what tone ring you use. So talk to me then about head, head choice. But, you know, do you, you went for okay. fl flash versus arched. Head choice. You mean the, that's the drum part, the flexible it's... membrane on the top of the head. On yeah. The top of the band. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the years ago, people would use uh, skin. They like, um, uh, what is it, calf skin or, or goat skin for the banjo head. And uh, occasionally you still see um, the natural skin heads. And, um, and, the, and that has an organic, um, maybe different tonality and so some people are still interested in that in that sound and it's possible with the neck fill design to use the original calfskin heads and you can mount your own in the neck fill and um and make that work uh, very easily but uh the typical head is made of mylar plastic which is a type of polyester you can't tear it or rip it. It's very, very strong. Um, and, and of course it reaches its yield point at some, at some point you can break a banjo head. And it, I think as a banjo player, we've all experienced uh, weird sounds and then finding a saggy spot in our head. We found that we busted a head and have to change it. Well, the neck fill banjo has a system of tightening the head but that puts even tension all the way around on the on the head. And so if you tighten it and over tighten it, it would be possible to break a head, but you never really do because that perfect tension is coming down evenly all the way around at the same time. And usually the head is broken by shearing like one point of the head too tightly through tightening, over tightening one of the lugs that mm. would be um, on a traditional banjo. 
but but yeah there's just aesthetic choices and there are different sounds from different thicknesses of heads and uh and it's also a a nice billboard you could put us <laughs> you could put a color or a uh, message or something on your banjo head and not ruin the value of the instrument or you know it's it's a nice exchangeable mm. surface that you can really um try different heads just for fun i like taking those renaissance heads which are kind of translucent and painting the underside with little splotches of um, spray paint. And I think I did that to your banjo. And you you have more of a interesting pattern that looks kind of like uh, maybe a, um, a old leather head that has been worn out or, or weathered somehow. A bit, <clears throat> bit like my own head. Worn out yeah. and weathered. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Have you a preference then tonally? Because we'll say the, let's say your quintessential white uh, banjo head versus Renaissance versus frosted versus clear. Yeah, yeah, I I do. I I change my mind a lot because I. Uh, it's easy to change a head in a neck fill and it's easy to change a head in a regular banjo. It just takes a little longer, but uh, I will uh, typically use a white head for all of my bluegrass banjos and um, just to not rock the boat. And there's enough design differences and differences in appearance that I don't want to make the banjo completely unrecognizable <laughs> as a banjo when I'm in a bluegrass situation. So so I will uh, use the white head in the bluegrass situations, usually frosted on the top for bluegrass because that keeps your banjo bridge without slipping around a lot. Uh, frosting on the bottom of the head gives you a similar sound, but uh, less noise from your fingers accidentally like rubbing on the head and so maybe uh is it true that the four string banjos are typically smooth top heads Tip typically yeah because of course uh with irish banjo the traditional sound was that kind of high-pitched pingy sound so you yeah. would get that with an with an arch top resonator um <laughs> And, and and generally the, the 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 white head, but there's more more frosted heads coming in now, and even some Renaissance. As mm -hmm. and I think part of it is kind of that the the trend has moved to maybe a softer sound of banjo or a more kind of warmer sounding banjo. Ah, interesting. Yeah, it seems that you lose some of that that cutting power when it's a a, a warmer sound. Like maybe it wouldn't be as loud in a in a session. That's not mightn't necessarily be a bad thing. I mean, the banjo can be very cutting. Yeah, and so that's it's another, um, <clears throat> I guess, musical choice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, it's another musical choice to decide what tone is appropriate for your group of musicians and and. Um, I think the format of a neck fill banjo is a little more conducive to adopting, adapting, I should say, to your own tone. Um, you can be very loud and cutting by just simply using that clear head and tightening the head to its maximum. And then the, the banjo bridge <clears throat> is a critical component that makes a huge difference in the tone and cutting power of a banjo so explain explain a little bit about that tom as well because i mean <clears throat> that's a whole new area for me was even looking at different types types of bridges and i yeah. i changed i changed out the bridge that that you put on my banjo um, and yeah. silvio ferretti in in um i asked russ carson Russ that plays with Ricky mm -hmm. Skaggs. I just sent him a yeah. text text one day and I said, what's the best bridge? And he just texted me back, Silvio Ferretti. And so I sent the yeah. me measurements yeah. to Silvio. And I he, wonder what, yeah, does Silvio use a special kind of maple or oh, wood? 
You're asking the wrong guy. I okay. do I do know I do know that the tone was appreciably different. Mm-hmm. And I would have been skeptical enough, not knowing enough about bridges. I would have said, yeah. surely, you know, unless you're doing bone or yeah. bone insert, I wouldn't have noticed the difference. But I would have noticed it appreciably war- uh, warmer to- warmer tone. Yes, and and that uh, the warmth of the of the tone has a lot to do with the um, with the weight of the bridge, and also the density of the material that the bridge is made out of. Usually we're talking about um, hard maple for the main part of the bridge with an ebony top. And that's the traditional way of making a bridge. And the chunkier, heavier bridges will, uh, will be actually a tone uh, sustainer. It'll, it'll be like a, a, an inertia mass, I call it. The, there's a lot of mass in the bridge which causes the string to vibrate for a longer time but at a lower amplitude. So you end up with um, maybe a less cutting sound, but a warmer tone because it's 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 more of a bong instead of a bing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know? Uh, we got highly technical there for a second, and then you ruined it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's actually, that's an excellent, an excellent description. More bong <clears throat> instead of bing. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, when you talk about sound, it's very it's very hard to uh, put put the qualities of sound into into descriptive words. Of course, it so is. yeah, yeah, and so that's why we have to pick up the instrument and try them and endlessly experiment. And uh, I think we we become kind of tinkerers, you know, as well as as musicians, uh, and and it's part of the fun, but. It's also uh, sometimes frustrating if if we go somewhere and the weather changes and uh, suddenly our strings are lower to the fingerboard or something like that. Um, we have to know a little bit about it so we can so we can maintain our instruments in a pinch and mm. uh, make sure they're they're always playable. Where do you feel that Neckville Banjos as a brand sits in the world of banjo brands? And I'm thinking specifically about somebody who is, let's say, some retired guy who's like, I always wanted to play the banjo. And he knows what a banjo looks like. And Neckville Banjos may not look like what he thinks a banjo looks like. Do you have any insight into what that's like for you trying to sell banjos? Well, I wish I knew the answer to that because you've pinpointed the probably the biggest challenge for a um, kind of a freewheeling banjo designer. Um, I don't do anything that is not, um, you know, proven uh, acoustically. And I'm using the same tone rings that were used back in the 1930s, for example, so the the ability to make the exact same sound is is there, but I have to qualify that a little bit because exact same isn't quite the right words to use. I try to find the elements of the sound that are banjo-y and most sought after and try to leave anything that is a negative to the banjo sound try to leave that to the side or leave it out of the sound and if you can for a moment imagine like the worst sounding banjo in the world what about that sound would would be bad would it be a jangliness that the strings are too bright or would it be a harsh sound or would it be not in tune or would it be um rattling you know against the frets those are all kind of unpleasant sounds, but, um, you know, we strive to get all of the things right and leave the things that are wrong out of the equation. And I think by reducing the number of parts in the banjo, we've increased the chances that you're just left with a pure banjo sound, a pure banjo tone without as much, um, interference from um you know rattly metal metallic resonances from the hardware that is typically on a banjo so i think that the 
they're different and it's hard it's hard to explain this to um a player that's always played a traditional banjo and their ear may be accustomed to a slightly more jangly sound and i think that the neck fills are typically less jangly and very even sounding from the low notes way up high to the very high uh, part of the neck. And so once in the hands of a musician, they become appreciated more and more, especially through the different environments of, of playing that you would experience uh, as a musician. You know, it's, um, it's an instrument that grows on people and they, they realize the, the, the benefits of it, uh, you know, during the the time which they own it, which is usually the rest of their lives, uh, they they have a dependable instrument. Um, I'm going to name drop now and say uh, Steve was going, Martin. That was going to be my next question. Is, <laughs> do you name, let's yeah. drop some names, Tom. Well, um, that you know, I the most famous customer I have is probably you, but no, the, the <laughs> second most famous congratulations on your Steve Martin award, because this, this is uh, Steve Martin himself has a neck fill banjo. And uh, shortly after he got it, he called me and he said that his neck fill became his number one go-to banjo. Like after one gig, he played it all night at a gig. And he called me and said that that was um, the case, and and I was blown away, and I thought it was really amazing that that I to a guy that has just played pre-war banjos and never bought a new banjo before, he uh, adopted mine, and it went right to the top of his list, and I was you know totally tickled, and I. You know, still, I to this day, I think he still uses that one as one of his main bluegrass banjos, but he does have several that you'll see him with. Um, and um, for I forgot where that whole story was leading, and your question you, was you were, you were going to do, drop you were going to drop more names, but I mean that doesn't get much oh. bigger than Steve Martin, right? No, 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 and so uh, of course uh, you know you're out there and and making a huge difference in in the uh, visibility of the neck fill name in in Irish music and uh, there's um, I think a, a growing number of Irish banjo players and so we definitely want to let the world know that we're in that business and we we do a lot of custom work for for cus for our customers and um, you know why we are not a big company we we make um you know less than 200 instruments a year but they are top quality and uh most of them are made specifically for uh, custom orders and um so we we try to hit the nail on the head for each customer they'll give us clues as to how they want it to sound we will try our best to put the all the components together in a way that delivers that uh, that result and we're we have a pretty good track record of of meeting that challenge hmm. well, do you get any feedback on uh, the adjustability of the banjo so from my point of view being a touring musician i i love the playability love the mm -hmm. tone my sound engineer adores it because he did used to sound you know he used to engineer an irish banjo and he had a much harder time with a lot of the overtones and the pinginess so mm -hmm. i plug i plug in the neck fill and he, and he goes sound check and he goes like yeah awesome it's you know just it's, it's completely <laughs> flat on the desk and that's it yeah yeah <clears throat> from my point well, of view was... the, the ease of being able to adjust everything it's so intuitive i can pop the back off tighten the head you know, go up to elevation. I'm going to have to drop it down because it'll get really tight. I can make adjustments to the neck. I do that all of the time because if I'm somewhere that's really dry, I'm going to have to, you know, let the neck back. Uh, if if we get into Ohio in the middle of summertime and it's soggy as all get out, I have to tighten yeah. the head. And I can do it in minutes as yeah. opposed to going around with this key on the drum head. Yeah, that's right. And um, 
I, I, you have me thinking about the effect of weather on a banjo and, um, the, the uh, quick adjustment features of the neck fill uh, might be handy in, in a weather change situation, but most banjos have a truss rod, which would uh, be the most common adjustment in a weather-related uh, change. So um, changing the tone is easy on a neck fill because of the head tension uh, is so quick and even that um that you can you know adjust your action in a hurry uh and if you're if your neck bows due to humid weather and your strings go close to the fingerboard and it buzzes yes you can tighten your head to bring the strings back up but the best adjustment in that case would be to adjust the bow in the neck so that there's enough bow to allow the strings to come off of the fingerboard so um that's just a, a decision that, uh, you know, as a, a repair man and builder, I'm always aware of the, the causes of the problems and humidity is, is a huge culprit when you're traveling. The, the different uh, barometric pressure and humidity can cause the neck to, to come in at different shapes. And so I would say first look at the neck in, in the case of travel and then um, and then, uh, go for the tone that you're looking for with, with your, uh, with your head tension. Normally you don't have to change the head tension if you got it sounding good. Uh, but, uh, there is the, another cool thing on the neck fills is that neck adjustment. Um, a lot of people don't like to mess with it because once you get your action right, you know, it's good to, good to go for a long time. But uh, if you change bridges and you want to go to a really high bridge, for example, because uh, your pick might be hitting the head too often and getting more noise, and you want to lift the, the playing surface away from the head by putting a taller bridge, well, then you, you can adjust the neck fill neck as a uh, quick adjustment to make your action low again. And so it's easy to play, but you still have the advantages of a high bridge. So, you know, th these are all decisions that um, are not obvious to the beginner or even advanced players sometimes because they haven't had these uh, easy adjustments available in their own banjos. So now it's, it's a whole new world. And even after 30 or 40 years of building, I'd say that the, the, main, the main hurdle and challenge is to get everybody up to speed on what is possible now in in the banjo um, a lot of the problems that were there are solvable with with the neck fill design and and i'm uh, you know thankful that i can talk about it in these kinds of hmm. settings yeah so of two two final questions uh number one have you perfected the neck fill design are are there new features is there something that you 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 want to do or you're planning on doing uh, yeah, there, there's. I think the basic design is perfected. The the um, you know the the frame of the instrument being like a giant um, nut and and the 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 threaded ring being like a giant bolt. That that system is well designed. Now it's what we put inside that that system. What what we put inside of that format that's a wide open field. I think we're just breaking ground on, I mean, we're, we're just uh, at the tip of the iceberg as far as what sort of tone rings work in a banjo. Um, I would like to hear what a glass tone ring sounds like or a ceramic tone ring. Um, and uh, there's countless varieties of, of materials and shapes and um, ideas that, that can go in as a tone, you know, tone enhancing or tone making component that we haven't even tried yet. Um, I've used wooden tone rings, wooden tone rings with metal hoops, titanium. Um, I've used Corian. Um, 
you know, and, and, uh, I'm just, uh, uh, fascinated with all of the different possibilities that, that we have, you know, in, in the banjo world. And, uh, I think it's a, it's, I think the, what, what I've done is given the instrument a format that it can use to, to grow over the, over the coming years, I think we'll see more variety offered in banjos and a lot of them will be built on, on, uh, the new design uh not i don't think everybody wants a new banjo but those that are looking for uh you know reliability and pure tone and new sounds uh they might be drawn to the neck felt so that they can do a little bit of experimenting and and also just be comfortable that they've got uh, a good you know a, a good solid format that's not going to change it's not going to be um, unpredictable. It's there's fewer parts and more reliability. And as Steve said, it was his road warrior banjo. You know, he can trust it and go to it, and it's always there. And, you know, ready to do the job. Hmm. So, yeah. fi final question: <clears throat> What uh, is there a banjo that you wish you owned? If there was one banjo that you could have, or a, a brand, or a model. Is there something that you would love, you'd love to have to play? You know, I, that's what I do. You know, I'm, I'm, I, my job is, is also fulfilling my own fantasies. Um, the banjo that I want is the one that I'm always working on. And the, the more I learn about building instruments, the more equipped I am to meet my dream banjo needs and so uh frankly i don't have a desire to play anybody else's banjo because i want that banjo to be the product of my own two hands and i want that uh i want that instrument to reflect a sound that is really coming from me not only you know in the in the musical realm but in the mechanical realm I just um, I'm proud of what I've done, and I want to see that that um, that banjo is is improved and tailored to my own my own uh, artistic want, you know. So <laughs> I, I really have this desire, and I think that I'm working on um, the latest neck fill that I that I'm working on is always one for me, and. And so once I get that banjo done, I will, I will have it uh, available uh, for show and tell and for someone to come along and purchase. And so, um, yeah, I'm on that quest. I'm on that journey. And that banjo is, is, is still out there. Uh, <laughs> and it's always, it's a process of, of improvement. That's a, I, I use that's an awesome answer. I like that. Well, thank you. <laughs> so you have a, well, just to wrap up, you, you've got a workshop in, in Minneapolis still. Uh, I know the two guys yes. up there and, and you, yep. you have a workshop in sisters. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's nice. I feel like we are expanding and uh, covering the country. Uh, we get a lot of business from the Northwest and our uh, former sales guy out, Al Price here was was really instrumental in, in building this this area up for sales. But I wanted to come out to the Northwest because it's a strong sales area and there's a lot of enthusiasm and there's a lot of great music going on in the Northwest. And so I'm supporting that by being here and doing repair and uh, and custom building in, in our sister's Oregon shop. And then I go back to Minneapolis periodically for for the uh, the main shop, but uh, my capabilities are growing here, right in Sisters with the uh, I got a CNC machine and and a whole store and uh, an inventory on the walls, and it's it's really a blast. Wonderful! I wish yeah. you all of the best. I can't wait to come and visit. I I have a 
a, a real fond uh, a fondness for sisters. Spent some time there, both playing and last summer went up there fished for four or five days. I loved it. Yes, every minute. Yes, yeah. that's cool. Well, I sure enjoyed the conversation today. 